physicians. Patients don't come in saying, I got PTSD. They may not even tell you they've been in the military. So what do they complain about? Insomnia, irritability, pain, erectile dysfunction, sexual dysfunction for women, GI distress, dizziness, headaches, especially if they have concomitant traumatic brain injury, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, trouble with concentration or substance abuse issues. And they don't even say we've been in the military or we've been traumatized. So you have to ask the question. So what often happens is they get treated with a treatment du jour. Can't sleep at night. We get some zolpidem or zaloplon or zopoglom or trazodone or something. And in many instances, the visit to us as treaters is not from the patient. It's actually from the spouse or the boss or the fellow employees or the kids insisting that they go. Treatment recommendations, the types of treatment. I'm giving you this in the right order. The first type of treatment, the type of treatment which is most effective according to the evidence is psychotherapy, not pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy. And I'll tell you what those are. Pharmacotherapy also has a place. And then there are others, animal therapy, dogs, horses, uh, hypnotherapy, uh, uh, other kinds, acupuncture, complementary alternative treatments and the like. So the basic principles of treatment, number one, if it's going to be effective, the patient has to understand and accept that they got PTSD. This is not just something that happens in war, it happens to everybody, no. This has got a name. It's PTSD. They've got to accept that. If they don't accept it, they're probably not going to get better. They have to understand and accept the treatment plan. They have to know what's being proposed to them and, and buy into it. And they have to actively participate in treatment and recognize that medication alone isn't going to cut it. Why do I tell you this? I know you're not going to probably treat them. But I want you to understand when they come to you and they say, I've been going for treatment to the VA for two years, and it hadn't done a doggone thing for me, that maybe it's because they didn't buy into the treatment. OK, so which of the following, based on evidence-based treatment strategies, should you consider to prescribe for PTSD, SSRIs, exposure and our cognitive-based psychotherapy, benzodiazepines, one and two, or all of the above? It's just like the fella said, tell me quick, they love a kick in the head. I'll give you the, uh, the answer in a bit. And then, which of the following, based on the evidence, should you consider for use in reducing nightmares in patients with PTSD? Trazodone, prazosin, sertraline, one and two, or all of the above? Still talk about that too. Psychotherapy. I, I bring these up just so you'll know what people are talking about. The evidence suggests that cognitive behavioral therapy, shorthand CBT, is the most effective treatment. There are problems with it though. The two types of, of CBT that are most common at the VA now, prolonged exposure, PE, so when you hear patients tell you, you know, they wanted me to write everything down. Hell, I've been trying to avoid it, and they want me to write everything down and keep doing it. I'll be doggone if I'm going to do that. That's prolonged exposure. And what prolonged exposure is about is an ability to, to short the activity of the limbic system by aiding the uh, prefrontal cortex. But it has to be done again and again to desensitize the person. And it has to be done in a safe place 
where the patient uh, knows and trusts the therapist. Cognitive processing therapy is, is akin, but it doesn't involve actually remembering the details. It involves trying to understand why you just did. Why did you jump when you heard that noise? Why did you get angry at something that didn't, uh, that shouldn't have made you angry? And what can you do about it? EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. That's kind of like CBT, but they have them move their eyes back and forth. There's some data that maybe that helps. There's some variations on those I won't go into. One is called ART, Accelerated Resolution Therapy, but they're EMDR substitutes. There's something called stress inoculation, which means learning to cope and deal with stress in a better way. And there's something called acceptance and commitment therapy, which means, hey, I realize I got it. I'm going to have it. My job is to cope and go on with my life. And there are other therapies that have been suggested. Let's talk about medications. If you're going to use medicines, it's important to explain the role of medicines. Medicines rarely make it all go away. They may be helpful for certain targeted symptoms. The only medicines that have been FDA approved are sertraline and peroxetine. That's because the others have equivocal results or just haven't bothered to do the testing. But there is data that some of the SNRIs, especially venlafaxine, Effexor, may be helpful as well. The SSRIs do two things. It may help reduce all the symptoms, but especially it helps with anger and irritability. One of the side effects of the SSRIs, you've probably seen it in your depression patients or anxiety patients, is that the anger and irritability, the fuse gets lengthened, if you will, so it gets a little less. Medicines to aid with sleep. Trazodone is not approved by the FDA, but is frequently used, especially at the VA, and probably by all of us. It's actually a side effect of trazodone. Trazodone doesn't interfere with REM sleep. It doesn't necessarily help with nightmares, but it does help with duration of sleep and getting more restful sleep. Prazosin, mini press, is the drug that helps with sleep. It's an alpha-1 antagonist, and it works by reducing norepinephrine, we think, which is released at night. Uh, dose somewhere between 1 and 20 milligrams is the dose for uh, hypertension. Most of the studies show that 1 to 13 milligrams helps with sleep, and it's generally given before bedtime. And it's like a miracle to many patients. The nightmares just seem to go away. Side effects are pretty minimal, except for orthostasis. Other antidepressants, there are studies with mirtazapine, uh, remeron, and nefazidone. Uh, and nefazidone is, is hard to get these days because of liver dysfunction, but there have been some positive studies with those as well. The atypical antipsychotics have gotten a lot of press recently. Uh, they probably, uh, they, they don't help all that much, but there was a positive study with uh, Risperdal, Risperidone, uh, and, and there were some studies with uh, quetiapine or Seroquel and Abilify that show they may be helpful. They're probably not the mainstays of treatment. The anticonvulsants may be helpful. The atypical anticonvulsants may be helpful uh, for some patients. Antiadrenergic uh, medications are really kind of interesting. Uh, there have been studies using propranolol after. Remember the problem with PTSD is not just the arousal symptoms, but it's the consolidation of memories from the, uh, from the hippocampus. And uh, there was hope that medications like uh, propranolol, a beta blocker, or clonidine, an alpha-2 agonist, might be helpful. The results aren't that great, but, but it, it's worth a shot. And there are other medications. The newer medicines that are being looked at, uh, D-cycloserine, 
is a drug that was released as ceramicin for tuberculosis. It is also an NMDA modulator, and, and there's some very positive stuff going on with it. Uh, I, I can tell you about the experimental stuff uh, later if, if you're interested, uh, but two things that have gotten some press in the last week. One is the opioid agonist. There was an interesting study showing that people that were involved in trauma that also had pain that were given morphine right away developed less PTSD. Nobody knows why. And you probably saw the study yesterday reported in, in the media about the gene, uh, I think it's OPRL1 or something uh, that's being tested in mice. Avoid benzodiazepines if possible. It doesn't work. It, it decreases consolidation and functioning of the cognitive behavioral therapy, and it, it runs the risk of, uh, of uh, 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 abuse. How many VA patients with PTSD get uh, benzodiazepines? 35%. 35%. Probably should not be used. Which of the following is a co-occurring condition with PTSD that you would be least likely to encounter as a comorbid condition? Substance use, depression, bipolar, generalized anxiety. Yeah, that's it. And the reason I even brought it up is to show you that these three, depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, are frequently comorbid with PTSD. Some studies as high as 80% of patients with PTSD will have at least one of these, depression, anxiety, or substance abuse disorders. There are some interesting studies on OCD variants. So, so what happens is when you're in a combat ready position, dopamine is flowing up in the brain. Dopamine is a feel good chemical. It's also one of the alerting chemicals. So one of the common complaints when people come back home is they just don't feel nothing. They're just blah. So to get the dopamine up, they use substances, they gamble too much, they get into porn, they start riding fast motorcycles or cars, they stop, start bungee jumping and doing risk-taking stuff just to raise it. Bipolar disorder is not one that's commonly comorbid. Uh, if you see a patient in your office that says, I'm going to the VA and I'm taking the medicine and doing the therapy and it ain't working, consider these. Maybe they're not taking enough of the dose, maybe it's a side effect that's getting in the way. Maybe they're not compliant because they didn't buy into treatment. Maybe bad things are going on in their life. They're unemployed, they have financial problems, their spouse is about to leave and their kids don't like them, etc. Maybe there's re-traumatization. Loss of social support, an important thing, maybe we'll talk more about that, or drug interactions. Recent studies have shown the best way to deal with PTSD and co-occurring substance abuse disorders is what? Complete CBT before you do the, I mean, complete the substance abuse treatment before, complete the CBT before the substance abuse, or do both at the same time. And the, the answer is three. That's from a study in JAMA from Australia, some folks named Mills. The concern always was, if you start the psychotherapy first, it'll make the drinking or drugging worse. If, if you do the other, they can't participate in the cognitive therapy. And so what they showed is doing both at the same time can work. And again, I tell you that so you'll understand 
in treating your patients. Common comorbid medical conditions. Traumatic brain injury, well, mild traumatic brain injury, what we call concussions. The, the most common type of injury in this war is explosive injury, which causes traumatic brain injury. It's not being shot, it's not being mortared, it's having an explosion close by, do things to your head. Uh, there's good data that those with PTSD are more likely to have cardiovascular problems, especially coronary problems and hypertension. Those with TBI are more likely to have headaches and dizziness and chronic pain. And because of the increase in cortisol, which does not get shot, uh, uh, stopped, uh, by the too much cortisol, uh, metabolic problems, especially diabetes and metabolic syndrome, immune disorders are common. Uh, TBI coexists in about 40% of patients with PTSD. So why should we treat them? Other than the obvious, self-esteem goes down the toilet. Imagine, imagine somebody who was a special ops marine they can't relate to his family anymore. They can't relate to a job. They can't get a job or keep a job. Relationships go down the toilet. I mean, uh, marriages are dissolving frequently. They, they, they get the GI Bill and go to school, but they can't concentrate. Remember, that's one of the arousal symptoms. They can't concentrate, and so they can't pass. Finances can be a real problem, especially if you're in the National Guard or Reserves. Legal problems, I can't tell you, I've been called to court a number of times to help veterans. Heroes with chestfuls of medals for bravery and heroism that got stopped for a DUI and then got into, the, into it with a cop. Now they've got a record and they can't get a job. And the health issues I've talked to you about, this is, uh, this is in our book, I'm not going to go over it in detail, but these are the, the, the recover process that we talk about. So in addition to what I've already talked about, I talked about how you view your issues in a different light, how you get a good support system and how important that is to the veteran and how you redefine the meaning of your life after PTSD. What happens with PTSD is people get tunnel vision. They see their whole life through their PTSD. And that's it. Suicide, you know it's a problem. You've been seeing about it in the news. So the Department of Defense has come out with programs to help prevent suicide. Would you like to guess how many programs the DOD now has to prevent suicide? Is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 200? The answer is it's 901. 901. So how effective are they? The suicide rate has never been higher amongst military members. It's one military member per day, 350 uh, per year. What about veterans? It's 22 per day over 7,000 per year. More veterans die in a year from suicide than have died in the full 10 plus years of the Middle Eastern War. And it's a tragedy. So take it serious. Don't be afraid to ask about suicide. And I don't say, so are you thinking of killing yourself or what? I mean, the question is, have you felt so down, so hopeless, that you thought life was not worth living. 